You're listening to the Simply Flawsome Show, a podcast designed for you to listen, learn, and leverage. Please welcome your host, Zoe Turner. I'm really excited to introduce today's guest on the Simply Flawsome Show. For 30 years, he's been at the forefront of real direct sales. He's personally made a million plus in straight commission in three different companies. And he's trained salespeople from global blue chip to a 74% increase in results in less than three months. So very excited to have him on so he can show us or reveal some of his sales secrets and possibly give us all some, some tips. So please welcome Stevie Q to the Simply Flossom podcast. Thanks, Zoe. That's, uh, that's a very auspicious introduction that you gave me there. Th- thank, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks. Steve, so for those of people that have never heard of you before, can you give us um, a brief background on where it all started for you? Yeah, sure, Zoe. I'd be, uh, I'd be delighted to do that. Well, you know what? That's a good question in itself, isn't it? Because until recently... Uh, I actually thought that I got involved in in direct sales when I was 18 or 19. That was the first sort of proper job that I had, um, knocking on doors in the north of England, selling uh, selling life insurance door to door on council estates. So you can imagine the two words that I heard most, Zoe, and I'll give you a clue. It wasn't come in. <laughs> but when I uh, <laughs> when I yeah exactly. So, uh, but we'll keep it a clean show. Um, but when I actually thought back, I started doing telesales when I was 14. We had a family friend who was a, you know, old school insurance broker. Um, your parents probably brought, you know, home contents insurance and uh, car insurance and buildings insurance, all, all that sort of thing. Um, and th- th- this friend of our family uh, did that. And so um, he recognized something in me and an ability to speak. And so sort of two or three nights a week when I was about 14 or 15, I would go to his office for two or three hours and just spend that time cold calling out of the telephone book to make him appointments to go and quote uh, people for their renewals on their insurance. So I've actually been into the telesales. I'm 54 now. Uh, I've been into telesales uh, from that tender age of 14. That was my first foray. So, um, Interesting. Steve, I have a question. 40-odd years. You. Yeah, I have sure. A question for you. That, was, that was about 40 years ago when you started in telesales. There's a lot of controversy now about cold calling and, and how it actually fits into the sales process a lot of people would effectively say that cold calling is dead what's your view on this uh yes yes and no so so b b to c business to private consumer cold calling not only is it dead i believe that in the uk now uh and in other countries it's actually illegal to call somebody unsolicited, you know, call a private individual and, uh, and pitch them on something without a prior opt-in or, or anything, especially in the wake of, uh, you know, G- GDPR. But B to B to C, uh, B to B, uh, it's not illegal to cold call a company. So that still works. Look, Cold calling is cold calling is one thing. I think it's always better if you call to follow up on an email or to fo- so. So there's a phrase now you've probably heard it: social selling. And what social selling means is that you start to do that spade work that you might have done with faxes or mail shots or something. The preliminary work you do that with social, sort of LinkedIn, Facebook, that type of thing. And then that would lead to a phone call. So, I, But in answer to your question directly, even businesses nowadays, I think that people prefer some sort of warm up, preliminary sort of contact before you just call them. So cold calling, it's, it's, a, it's a bit old school. It's a bit sort of, uh, yeah, not done that much anymore, but it can still be used. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. What do you think about, I mean, obviously a lot has changed from when you first started to where you are now. And 
there's so much focus now on video content. And I know personally that that's something that you do or have started to do a lot of. How important do you feel that is in increasing your brand and getting your message across in today's um, market? Uh, well, I feel it's very important. And I know, I know that you do as well, uh, because I watch all of your videos as well. And I know that you had that um, spate, uh, was it last year, where you did, a, you did a video presentation every day for 30 days, which I thought was commendable, you know, because um, that's quite a commitment to, to stick to. And I think that engaging with your audience or prospective clientele by video and even, you know, having little video outros as email signatures is really important nowadays because people, yeah, everything is literally, you know, the solution to everybody's problems uh, and the problem to, uh, which is everybody's problems is, as I say, it's in the arse pocket of your Levi's. It's called a mobile phone, you know, and, um, people are omnipresent everywhere now you know it's it's a very very small world and being able to engage with your audience by video let them see who you are see your mannerisms how you come across i think it's vitally important in fact i'd go so far as to say that if you're not doing that um then you're doing yourself and your your customers and your chance of increasing your business um a, a massive disservice and i think you'd probably agree with that I do, yeah. How frequently would you say that one has to, one should be putting out videos and what platforms would you be focusing on? Well, for me, I've got a, uh, I've got a Facebook uh, business page uh, and I've got LinkedIn and I try to put something out on LinkedIn probably three, four times a week, yeah? Uh, but it's like anything, Zoe. Sometimes you get really, really into it and, you know, and I, I do two or three videos in a day and probably put those out across various platforms. YouTube as well. Um, and then other days, I don't like... I don't like having to create content for the sake of creating it because that's forced and, you know, so if I wake up with the inspiration to actually share a message with people, that's all well and good. And that, and if I'm feeling particularly creative that day, that might happen three or four times. But to actually sit down and think, mm, what can I say to people um, and ponder over it, that's when it's a little bit forced and I don't like doing that. Have you experienced that yourself? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I do yeah. feel though making that commitment. You know, I you you're right. Last year, I did I did it made a commitment for forty days of happiness, and I was um, I, I went you know kind of um, public and said that I was making this commitment. So I was yeah. holding myself accountable, and. And I have to say, I didn't actually complete the 40 days, <laughs> but when I, I, I think I did up to about 30, so I had about 10 days to go. And when yeah. I stopped doing it, it had gotten to the point that it was actually just becoming quite natural for me. When I first started doing those videos, I would literally record it about 10, 20 times sometimes before I, you know. Um, right. Before I, before I had a result that I was happy with. And then towards the end, it, that was it. It was just so much more natural. And they say it takes kind of like 30, 40 days for habits to form. And it's so yeah. very, very true. Or it was in this case. Because I went from doing loads of takes to literally being so much more confident and literally just completing it all in one take. I haven't done much content these last few months, and I have to say, I do feel it's something that, that should be um, a, continuous, um, a continuous thing that you're doing. So you're building a relationship with your audience, and they're getting used to seeing you on a regular basis. But you're right, it's also about value. It's not just about doing it for, you know, for, for content's sake. So, because if you do, people yeah. just... Well, what 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 the hell is she or he talking about? You know, and they they're just not going to listen to it. But it is about providing value. But I do feel that kind of making that commitment to do it. You know, if not every day, at least 
two or three times a week, you know, it is going to become a, a natural process and you're going to get a lot easier and a lot better at it. Yeah, of course, you know, and, and like you just said there, you, you're doing like maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 takes because you weren't happy. Then it, it, after 20, 25 days, you become a one-take wonder because you, you just know how to do it. It feels natural. You're very comfortable in it. You're not feeling self-conscious by that stage. And you're absolutely right when you say the, uh, the experts say with most of us, some people it's quicker, some people it's longer, but with most people, takes about 30 days to form a new habit, to embed a new habit or to, um, you know, to, to, to replace a, uh, a limiting belief or habit with a positive one, yeah? Yeah, yeah. What success, I've got another question for you, Steve. What successful attributes do you feel that an individual needs to be a successful salesperson? Uh, well, they've definitely got to be a little bit quirky. And by that, I mean, um, you, look, more people, no, no matter who you are, no matter how good you are, how slick you are, how experienced you are, more people are going to say, a lot more people are going to say no than say yes, because it's a numbers game. So you've got to be able to deal with that and not take rejection personally. Yeah. So. That's, that, that's, that's one thing, you know, if somebody says, I hate your product, I'm not buying it. They're not saying I hate you. They might like you, but they're still not going to buy something that they don't want to buy. So you have to put that into context in your own mind and realize that rejection is not a personal thing. And I, but I'm, I'm the kind of person that, you know, if it was, so what? I don't care. I'd like you to like me, but I don't really care whether you do one way or the other. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, but I prefer it that you did, yeah? And that I can make a positive impact. Um, I think you've got to enjoy talking to people. I think you've got to have a good work ethic because, as I said, it's a numbers game. Um, and I think nowadays, more than any, ever, you've got to be really good at asking questions, engaging with people and being as honest and transparent and, you know, BS free as, as you can. Uh, that, that's, you know, if you wanted some secrets, even though they sound obvious, they might be quote unquote secrets to, to doing the job today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why were you so successful as a salesperson? Because I'm the, I said to somebody the other day, and I might have even put it in the post as, in, in a post as well. I'm a very persistent person by, by nature. So I, I will knock and knock and knock and call and call. I, I will keep calling you. Um, but this is my default. Yeah, this is, this is me. This is Steve. I will call you and call you and call you until you either say something rude to me block me or engage in a conversation with me and say right well it's for me or it or it's not but at, at least we know now yeah so I'm a very tenacious very persistent person and I think that's what helped get me started you know I, I got to I got to like the no's I got to like the rejections I embraced the uh, the rejections and then you know you finally say oh really you you, you want it <laughs> Great, fantastic, you know, uh, and then you start to get more of those come, come, come along, yeah? Do you feel that your early days of door knocking prepared you well for later years to come? Yeah, definitely, Def definitely. I mean, I was, I was selling, I was selling like, like I said, you know, the, 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 the two words I heard most frequently. Um, and then when I got into houses, a lot of the houses, there were types of places you wiped your feet on the way out, you know, but it's, it, and there's a lot of people who started in that place as well. It's amazing how many people I've talked to who are in this industry that I'm in now or, or similar industries who started in financial services back in the 1970s, 1980s knocking on doors on council estates, selling savings plans, selling pension plans. And there was no restrictions then. You could go and knock on doors. You could, I mean, one of the things I used to do was that I used to buy a thing called the electoral roll from the library. And then I could see, I could see your family on there, for example, Zoe. And when you were the, at the tender age of 17, your name would get put on the electoral roll in red or blue, which would show that you would be eligible to vote next year 
So I would contact you or your parents and tell them that, you know, I'm Stephen from Citibank. I want to come and talk to you because you probably just started work. I want to come and talk to you about savings plans and, and making provision for the future and stuff like that. So there was a lot of initiative, but also there was no restrictions. It wasn't illegal. There wasn't data protection or anything like that. I could just call up. Are, are you with me on that? Yeah. 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 I guess things have changed a lot. I know here in the UAE, as you know, I live in the UAE. And yeah. there aren't really any specific laws in relation to data protection. However, cold calling, I believe cold calling is actually illegal here now. But when I first moved out here 10 years ago, it wasn't illegal to cold call. And that is how I started. That's how I started as an ex-social worker with zero sales experience. And I went you know, to being one of the best, one of the top performers in the company. And that was literally just through picking up that call, that phone. And, yeah. And, and, and cold calling. And actually, I, I would say my success wasn't down to cold calling. My success was down to other marketing strategies that I, that I put into place. Um, you know, doing events and, and whatnot and things like that. But that le this leads me on to my next question because sales sure. is, is um, you know, it's, it's a strange industry in many respects because anybody can be a salesperson. You can be a, high, you can be a school dropout and, you know, um, and, and enter into the sales environment and yeah. earn like a ton of money, you know. Um, basically, anyone can go into sales anyone any kind yeah. of misfit can go into sales you don't really need any proper qualifications um you know what what's your kind of what's your view on that well my view on that is thank god for that <laughs> else, else I, I often say to people i got for all of my o levels you know i i got a for maths i got a for english i got a for history i got a for geography and they, and they sit there and they think, oh, he's clever, until I say that A, that A stands for absent, because I didn't take any of the exams, Zoe. So uh, it's a good job, but you don't really need any qualifications to get in sales, you know? Um, it's, it's interesting, actually. It just flashed in my mind. You watch that program, Dragon's Den, yeah? Yes. Yeah, D Duncan, uh, there was a spin-off program about the dragons, and that guy, Scottish guy with the... Uh, hotels and health clubs, Duncan Bannatyne, he, it, it, this program was featured on him. And uh, he stood outside a prison in Scotland and he said, when I was a young man, I ended up in here for a while inside the Nick, you know. He said, so uh, on the day they released me, he said, that in, back in those days, it was a big disgrace to have been to prison for anything. He said, so he said, I had no choice but to become an entrepreneur. And sales is a bit like that. You know, all sorts of people from all walks of life end up in sales. And usually, this is my observation, whether it's in direct sales or whether it's in network marketing, some of the most unlikely people end up making it really, really big, making lots of money and, and, and becoming successful. You know, people who, people who you would think, uh, but just by the look, by the sound of them, the whole thing would not, you know, the one of li life's waifs and strays, and they end up being super successful. And I mm. honestly think it's down to hunger and, and persistence. I really do. You know, they've, they've got no, it's that thing, isn't it? You know, if you hit rock bottom, where else have you got to go? Yeah. What's your view on network marketing? I love it. I mean, um, uh, uh, Bob Proctor, who I know very well, said to me uh, that network marketing is the most lawful way that a person can earn money. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, by lawful, he said, I mean spiritually lawful. He wasn't talking about, you know, the, the, the police and the judicial system. He said the most spiritually lawful. He said, because if you're doing it with the right intent for the right reasons, you only get paid as a result of helping somebody else. You know, it's like that old adage, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, then you feed him for the rest of his life. You know, and I think Zig Ziglar once said, 
if you you can have everything you want out of life if you will only help enough other people to get what they want out of life. And that is, I know there's a lot of sharks and there's a lot of deals done in network marketing, but in its purest form, that's the true ethos of the business. And that's exactly what Bob P meant when he said it's the most spiritually lawful way of making money. Because really, we should be able to get everything we want, you, me, everybody else, Zoe, um, get our rewards as a result of just helping other people along the way. Um, and that often gets overlooked, doesn't it? And salespeople get tarnished with a, uh, you know, with a, with a different sort of reputation to that. Mm. Network marketing has become a lot more prominent, I would say. Or I've noticed it a lot more in the, in the last few years. And, you, you know, personally, I know myself, I've been inundated with like requests and friend requests and people I don't know. And all I need yeah. to do is quickly look on their profile. If I see a picture of a woman with a, you know, a background picture of wish, dream, believe or whatever in the background, I know she's a network marketer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You know the type, yeah. of, the type yeah. of she's I know she's a network marketer and that she's she's yeah. either plus forever living or it's something else. And I don't yeah. tend to accept them anymore. Um yeah. you know yourself that I've dabbled a little bit in network marketing and yeah. uh, and it was um it was with a company well, I mean I'll say what it was, it was with for Forever Living and yeah. uh, who've they been around have, a long time. They're one of the titans of the industry, aren't they? Certainly are. And I have to say, they'd approached me so many times and, um, and I'd always said no. And then a, a friend who I went hiking with, he suggested it to me years later, a couple of years later, and I kind of was at a bit of a crossroads. So I thought, you know what, I will actually yeah. give this a go. And I did find that that wasn't for me. Um, you know, yeah. great marketing plan, but I personally felt that it was saturated. Um, yeah. So what do you feel, how important do you feel that timing is when it well, comes well, to marketing? Everything. Yeah. It, 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 I, you know what? You just took, literally took the words out of my mouth. I have a friend of mine, a lady called Elaine Fishberg, who I actually did a podcast with. A couple of years ago and, and and Elaine has been hugely consistently there's a word for you consistently successful she's not a one-hit wonder consistently successful for more than 30 years in network marketing yeah and and if you so Elaine will always say to people if they say no thank you she's so right fantastic I, I realize the timing may not be right for you that's fine who else do you know? Give me, help me. Who, who else do you know? Um, because timing is so important. You know, you can catch somebody when they are very, very busy with other things who, like you said, when you hit a certain crossroads or, or you know, a certain time in your life, it might be just the right time. You just might catch somebody when they've fallen out of love with the company that they'd been with or they're busted up with, you know, um, and other times it might not be viable for them. So timing is vitally important in everything, get, actually, not just in network marketing. Yeah, I get what you're saying in that respect. When I, spoke, when I mentioned timing, I actually meant it from timing in relation to entering a company. Like, say, the company that I got involved with had been around for a number of years. The people that yeah. I got in at the beginning, yeah, yeah. Um, were they're really high earners um in in the company and yeah. so how crucial do you think kind of getting into a marketing company when it's a relatively new company as opposed to established company that's been around and built a reputation well there's there's two answers to that zoe so obviously, if you if if a, if a new company with a great product appears and it and it's ve and you do your research and you know that the people running it are good people and you know that it's well funded, that is clearly um, a, what we call a ground floor opportunity. You know, so like you say, with with Forever Living products or with Herbal Life or with Amway or any of those big companies, 
most people that you or I would put on our list if we join those companies will have either been in it, tried it, are still in it, or have been pitched on it and decided it weren't for them. Like you say, it's so well known, it's almost saturated, yeah? So if you join a new company that is well-funded with good people with good integrity and a great product or service that they're selling, then just by, by default, by definition, when you approach people, they won't have heard of it. So at least you're in with a shouting chance of them taking a look and not prejudging it to the extent they would the other one, yeah? But then yeah. I would, I would, I would and, and that's kind of obvious, but I would add on the end of that, even though Amway's been around forever and Herbal Life and, and Forever Living, there's still going to be some housewife who, you know, just gets dumped by a husband and ends up with, you know, a single mum with three or four kids to feed. There's still going to be a story of a woman joining one of those businesses uh, or, or a kid with a dream, you know, who wants to put himself through college of joining Amway or Forever Living or Herbal Life and in, in two or three years being one of the superstars and leading lights, you know, but just because yeah. it was particularly for them and they were in the right time at the right place and everything was in alignment. Yeah, if that's a helpful answer. Yeah, I, as you know, I've worked in sales for a number of years in Dubai in financial services, which is very yeah. cut And the whole sales process is a roller coaster. Uh, that's what I found personally. How have you, how do you manage the ups and downs, the ups of, you know, obviously earning amazing money, having say, you know, 40 grand months to then ha earning nothing. And, you know, what, what I found myself is that I would kind of associate my self-worth with the amount of sales that I was getting and I felt that negatively it wasn't contributing in a positive way. It wasn't contributing positively to my mental health. Right. Well, I, I, my, yeah, I'm, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert on mental health by any stretch of the imagination. I'm probably more of an expert on mental toughness and resilience, yeah? But I would say you have to separate yourself from the two from the two things so if you have a bad month you, you cannot or you should not or you should try not to let that reflect on your self-esteem yeah because if you're if you are trying and if you do, you can do all the same things in in february as you did in january when you had a great month and have a really diabolical month in February. And that can be for a lot of, you know, out of directive reasons, you know, things that you have no control over. You could make just as many calls, but, you know, half of those people could have been going on holiday and they say, call me next month. And then there could be lots of other reasons. And you cannot really afford for your own mental health and your own self-esteem to let that be a reflection of how you see yourself and how you feel about yourself. We all love it when we have a 40 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand month. Yeah, that's great. Um, and if it were like that every month, it'd be like winning the lottery, wouldn't it? And you know what? You'd soon get bored of that in a way. Um, so you, you have to be able to take the ups and the downs. I remember when I, was, um, when I was very new to life insurance, I was knocking on doors and I was having to do loads. And this was in the 80s. I was having to do loads and loads of cases to earn about five or six grand a month in around about 1986, 87, maybe 20, 30, 40 small cases. And sometimes I'd earn eight, nine, 10 grand a month. And then I got a client with a nursing home and um, we can were I doing just, a Can I just interrupt quickly? Yeah. In, those days, in those days, that was amazing money. I know. It was yeah, yeah, it was great. And I spent it all, Zoe. <laughs> You just earn it and spend it. Easy come, easy easy go. I mean, it's not bad money now, is it? Eight, nine, ten grand a month. It's not bad, but, but uh, yeah, it was it, it was amazing. But um, yeah, but I, I got I got what I call big case itis because I jumped on with this guy with these nursing homes, and we were doing a big commercial loan for him, and the commission alone from the from the key man life insurance was going to be around about fifty grand. And, and we thought this was going to be done and dusted within a month. 
it ended up taking about 18 months. And of course, now I'm going to earn 50 grand from one deal. I don't want to go knocking on those doors that I hate knocking on, really. You know, so I stopped it. And then the deal didn't go through. But it, it'll go through next month. And I didn't. And all of a sudden, now I've ended up broke. And it's like 10 times as hard to actually go back to your grassroots and start knocking on those doors again and selling 20 quid a month plans. Yeah. So I yeah. think you've got to be, you've got to keep yourself grounded. You've got to keep you've got to wake up every morning and be grateful for what you've got. Be grounded. Take a minute and aspire to do a little bit better. And when you have a 40 or 50 grand month, save at least half of it for the month that you're going to need it. <laughs> that would be my advice. Because those months yeah. will come. Yeah, they'll come. Do you think when people are focusing on the sale too much and how much commission they're going to earn? that that's when the money's not going to come the way because there's a lot now and the, I love the way sales have progressed over the years now and, and now it's about giving value it's really about providing value to your customer and if you mm. focus on giving value then the money is just going to kind of flow whereas I know a lot of the time in the past, maybe when, for me personally, when cases haven't come into fruition, it's probably because you've been focusing on the money too much and the outcome and, you know, what you're going to get into your bank account. And the laws of the universe doesn't really work that way. No, I, you, you're, you're spot on, uh, spot on the money there, if you'll pardon the pun. I think, look, like, like the analogy in network marketing of being, you know, spiritually lawful, helping someone. If you are focused on helping someone and putting value into someone's life or someone's business, if that is your focus and your intent, that's your, that's your vibration. That's what goes out there to the universe. And that's what, you know, that, that's the basis of the law of attraction, right? Um, you know, there's a saying, isn't there? Money goes, money will go where it's invited and stay where it's welcome. Yeah. So if that is your intention to, to help people and you are genuine and sincere in that, then as you say, the money will flow the minute that you are solely focused and don't then believe me, I've done it more than anyone probably. The minute you are solely focused on the money, 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 give me the goddamn money that's when it decides it's going to go to somebody else and flow in a different direction, yeah? Because it's, you're not inviting the money in the correct way, yeah? Money goes where it's invited and it stays where it's welcome. And that's all to do with spirituality, vibration, frequency and intent, yeah? Mm -hmm. mm. As you well know, Zoe, as you well know. So you can go to university and you can qualify as a you know, a doctor, physiotherapist. There isn't anywhere specific where you can go to qualify as a salesperson, at least not in traditional education. Where would you no. suggest, if someone wants to get into sales, what would you suggest that they do in order to educate themselves on the sales process? Well, you know, today, as, as, again, as you well know, there's just so much stuff out there uh, good stuff on YouTube and on the internet, but you are uh, so much content that you can get without even having to pay anything in, in monetary terms. You just got to study a little bit. Um, I would per personally, I would, if I was advising somebody, if they were getting into sales, I'd get into sales or, or the moving of a product or service that they were genuinely interested in. Yeah. Because if they're genuinely interested in it and they believe in it, then what we just talked about there, about adding value and wanting to help and, and, and benefit the businesses and the customers that we are serving, there's a key word, serving, yeah? Um, I think it was in, what is there something, I'm not big on the Bible or anything like that, but there's a thing that uh, that guy, Jim Rowan, who was Tony Robbins' mentor, he said, what he quoted one of the Bible scriptures, and he said, it says, find a way to serve the many. That's the path to riches. Find a way to serve the many. As Richard Branson found a way to serve many people, you know, as Bill Gates found a way to serve many people. Did Steve Jobs find a way to serve many people? You know, God, did they ever, you know, they serve a lot of people. Um, so I would find something that you believe in sincerely and you're passionate about 
and then just go out there and look to look to serve, add value as, as many people as, as you can. That would be my advice. And, 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 you know, read books on the subject, attend seminars, you know, that, that type of thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve, what advice would you give to yourself at 18 years of age? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Wow. Uh, that's like a sucker punch, that Zoe. Thank you. What advice would I give? That's like saying hindsight's a wonderful thing. I'd say, um, like I just said there, when you have a great month, keep some of the money. You know, sale, one, one of the traits of salespeople he, and a lot of entrepreneurs as well is, you know, if they have a hundred grand month, they spend 150 grand, yeah? Uh, if they have a 200 grand month, it, it's just one of those things. So I would definitely advise the 18-year-old Steve, save more than you spend, um, buy property, uh, rent property out, get it paid for by other people, and then keep it, keep the, you know, develop multiple sources of income, earn money while you sleep. I mean, there's so many things, but for me personally, there's always a, there was always this desire to uh, go out and buy a new Rolex, go out and buy a new, even though I'd only bought one the week before, or a new car, and I'd only bought one a month before, you know? always to be the brashest and the flashest but I'm not like that anymore because life has taught me those lessons so if I could part in advice to people who are doing well in sales or, or in the entrepreneurial world when they're young is you know live on what you need to live on have a great lifestyle but don't spend for the sake of spending it and save it or invest it wisely because the rainy day always comes you know and, and it's difficult to see it when you're doing well you know when you're having it off and doing really, really well, it's difficult to see the rainy day, but it is there down the line, you know, in one form or another. Mm. Thank you, Steve. Steve, you mentioned Bob Proctor. Has he been yeah. a previous mentor in yours? If yes, um, how was that experience? If not, have you ever had a mentor? Yeah, I've had, I've had a few mentors. And yeah, Bob Proctor was a mentor to me for a while. Um, I did a thing of his called the uh, Head of the Table Group. Um, I, I actually worked for him for a while, well, oh, back in, what, 99, 2000. See, somebody gave me, somebody who was a lady uh, who was in network marketing. She worked for a company called Nikan, which is a massive Japanese network marketing company. They sell uh, health, well-being mag magnet products, yeah, for the body. And, and Proctor was a, um, like an ambassador speaker. His wife was also one of their top sales uh, distributors, yeah? And I got this tape that had been recorded over and recorded over and passed around. And something really, really sparked in me when I heard this guy speak. Yeah. And so the, the whole thing, I saw an advert in the Sunday Times saying become a facilitator for Bob Proctor's Science of Getting Rich. And that jumped, the name wouldn't have met, meant much to most people, but it jumped off the page to me. And so I went and spent a week with him in near to Southampton, and I became a licensed facilitator for his programs, yeah, and specifically that science of getting rich, which was based on a book by Wallace D. Wattles. And our relationship kind of went on from there. I hired him to speak to 150 of my salespeople in around about 2005, 2006. Um, and, 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 yeah, I went to America with him. I also had another really good mentor who was an English guy called Richard Denny, who was sort of one of the founding fathers of UK sales training and personal uh, development and very different from Bob Proctor, but very inspiring. And all I can tell you is when I used to meet Richard once or twice a month, we'd, we'd meet at a hotel or at the, uh, at the Institute of Directors. I'd spend about 90 minutes with this guy. And this is what experience does for you. Sadly, is gone now. But whatever my issue was, whether it was good or bad, whether we were really riding high or whether I was facing challenges, this guy had been there, done it, got the T-shirt, and he could really give me experiential, sincere advice. And he was also extremely inspiring. And I used to walk away from those mentoring sessions 
feeling like I could literally, I felt so confident, so fired up, like I could walk through a brick wall and it wouldn't harm me. Okay. How would someone find a mentor? For the people out there who have never had a mentor before, but they're feeling maybe a little bit stuck and they would like some direction, how would they go about finding a mentor? And what would they need to look for? Okay, so look, there's... <laughs> This is a very, very, very crowded space nowadays, yeah? Um, back, back in the... I'm, I'm talking like back in 2000 when I was doing... Because I took a long break to do some other businesses from this. There weren't that many people in the space. And now when you go on Facebook and LinkedIn, you've got people who are 18 and 19, 20 years old saying they're a life coach, they're a mentor, they're a this, that and the other. Well, look. I'm sure their intention is really good and most of them, their integrity is good. But how can somebody of 20, you know, unless they are exceptional, like a child prodigy, like an Elon Musk or somebody like that, yeah? How can they be a, a, a life coach or a mentor? Unless it's to a five-year-old, yeah? So I would say find someone who's got experience, real experience, in the area that you want to major on, that you want to focus in, yeah? Real life experience, got the battle scars, has got a few, you know, a few miles on the clock and has had the successes and also had the failures as well. Because if you want advice, you want real life advice, you know? Okay. Thank you for that. So th That's my okay. My last question, Steve. Yeah. What piece of advice would you give to the 18, 19, 20-year-old listening to this that are unsure what they would maybe like to do and they're thinking about going into sales and they've got the whole life ahead of them? What advice would you give them? That's a good question as well and one that I wasn't expecting. Uh, the advice I would give is, is, get, is become as tech savvy as you possibly can be. If you look at the rate of things that, you know, since, um, since, since you were a kid, since I was a kid, the rate of change is phenomenal, isn't it, Zoe? You know, people don't like change because it takes them from a familiar area to an un unfamiliar area and, the, and it becomes uncertain. But I honestly think over the last three, four, five years, we've probably had 30, 35, 40 years worth of normal change lumped on us, you know, because things are moving that quickly. And guess what? They're not going to slow down. So the people who, there's a saying by Eric Hoffer, who was a modern day philosopher. He said, in times of change, the learners shall inherit the earth, whilst the learned shall find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world which no longer exists. So that basically means the people who are keeping themselves up to date and learning all the new stuff and being tech savvy, being mobile savvy, because that's where it's all at, um, they're the people who will get ahead and they're the people who will understand the economic and, you know, this is a big thing now, isn't the FinTech, financial technology. That's what it is. It's technology. The people, I met somebody the other day who used to work for me. The kid's only 35. And I said, are you on WhatsApp? He said, oh, no, mate. No, what's that? What's that? And I said, well, you're, not, you're on Facebook. No, what, I've heard of it. And the kid's still using fax machines and sending letters out through the post. Well, he's got left behind somewhere. You know, he's, he's fallen through the cracks. I would say to people who are 18, 19, 20, just get tech savvy, you know, just know what to, what to do with these mobile phones and computers because that really is where it's at. And I think that more and more of these kids will be digital nomads. They will be people who are freelancers, who can work from anywhere, literally from the back pocket of their jeans, Zoe. I think the days of a traditional job for life and a pension and a gold watch at 65, that's that's long gone, mate. That's long gone. Mm. Thank you, Steve. It's been wonderful speaking to you and you've provided some really valuable pieces of nuggets there for, for the Simply Flossom listeners. And yeah, Thanks. it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thanks for having me, Zoe. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I will speak to you very soon. And uh, if there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. Cheers, Zoe. <laughs>